The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Ontario's New Democrats want a Green New Deal, and this month they launched their policy proposal to get there, with billions for energy retrofits, renewables and jobs. Tonight we'll assess the viability of that plan. First up, economist and a former governor of the banks of Canada and England is with us, Mark Carney, on why he's written a book arguing for a new brand of capitalism. It's Tuesday, March 23rd, and that's next on The Agenda. Few people have had a better perch from which to understand the workings of the world economy than Mark Carney. He spent five and a half years as governor of the Bank of Canada, only to leave that post and take up an even bigger one as head of the Bank of England. Now, back on this side of the pond, he's taken on two new roles as United Nations Special Envoy for Climate Action and Finance and as an author. His book is just out. It's called Values, Building a Better World for All, and it brings Mark Carney to our virtual studio from the nation's capital. And we are delighted to welcome you back to Upper Canada and to our program. How are you doing? I'm very well, Steve. Thanks for having me. Not at all. I'm going to start by reading uh, what I think is sort of the heart of the argument you make in the book. We'll read an excerpt here and then we'll come back and have a chat. For over 12 years, you write, I had the privilege and challenge of being a G7 governor, first in Canada and latterly in the UK. During this time, I saw kingdoms of gold rise and fall. I led global reforms to fix the fault lines that caused the financial crisis, worked to heal the malignant culture at the heart of financial capitalism, and began to address both the fundamental challenges of the fourth industrial revolution and the existential risks from climate change. I felt the collapse in public trust in elites, globalization, and technology. And I became convinced that these challenges reflect a common crisis in values and that radical changes are required to build an economy that works for all. Okay, let's get into this. The core values that we need to incorporate back into our economies are what? Okay, well, again, thank you for that and uh, for having me on. Um, you know, I think we saw, and in the run-up to becoming governor of uh, the Bank of Canada, um, of course, we had the start of the financial crisis. It really broke uh, once I became governor, not because I became governor, but once I became governor. Um, and that is a period where uh, we had put excess faith uh, globally, particularly in markets um, and values of dynamism and efficiency, uh, which are important, but uh, in isolation, ultimately um, sow the seeds of their own uh destruction. Um, what we have undervalued, and we see it in the COVID situation, what we've undervalued are values like resilience, um, sustainability, we see that in the climate crisis, solidarity, um, uh, by which I mean solidarity with our fellow citizens lifting all up, uh, fairness, uh, responsibility, and, you know, the challenge, and humility, quite frankly, uh, as well, recognizing the limits of our knowledge, recognizing that things can go wrong, planning for failure, um, and uh, recognizing recognizing that with success comes responsibility. Uh, so it's the book is charts the course of how when we get this wrong, how we sow the seeds of these crises and, and looks at the various ones, then tries to tease out the response from the response to the various crises of credit of COVID of uh, climate, uh, how through the response that we're trying to reequilibrate uh, these values. And then to general, not to generalize, but to bring the lessons uh, more broadly for uh, for companies, for leaders, uh, for countries uh, in terms of what should we do? What, how, how do we actually put this into action? How much luck do you think you had trying to get those two, you know, rather august institutions to think a little more broadly about what the nature of capitalism ought to be? Uh, well, the first thing is to recognize I had a lot of luck to lead those two august institutions. Um, and with that, you know, I think it comes some responsibility. In terms of, um, 
In terms of the Bank of Canada, um, uh, I think the nature of the institution, I think the bal uh, there is uh, that balance in that institution, a, recognize, a recognition within its, um, within its responsibilities that it, that it has these broad, it, it plays a role in these broader responsibilities, whether it's around financial inclusion, whether it, in terms of our response to the crisis was to draw on the resources of the Canadian financial system and encourage uh, the Canadian financial system and you know, the banks at the core uh, to contribute to the solution, and to their credit, they did, um, and that's why. Act, that's one of several reasons why Canada fared much better. Uh, it's a sort of untold story, or untold story until it's told in the book. Um, now, with respect to the Bank of England, I mean, candidly, I was brought there because uh, of, of failures, failures of that institution, failure of the system in the UK. When I mean system, I mean the broader system uh, in terms of. Uh, undervaluing resilience, uh, not having fairness and responsibility in, uh, in that system. And it required, in order to address it, a series of reforms to the institution itself, that august institution itself, uh, which wasn't a very diverse institution, wasn't a very, you know, had, didn't have inclusive decision-making processes, uh, didn't have the outreach across the country, so didn't have the perspective uh, that's necessary to truly live values. I mean, one of the points in the book is, you know, you see most clearly economic impacts uh, if you see from the periphery, if you see from the perspective of those who are unemployed or underemployed or worried about their futures. That's a far better vantage point uh, than, uh, you know, the corner of King and Bay. Um, and in order to do that, you've got to get out uh, and about and, and talk and and, uh, and and engage and employ people from those perspectives. And that's uh, much of what had to happen at the Bank of England. Uh, I was telling you before we went on the air that um, th this you have written a very serious book, and I learned a hell of a lot reading the book. Um, I kind of joked as, a, you know, a bit too much Karl Marx and not enough Groucho Marx, but we will get yeah. into some... <laughs> well, let, let, you know what? <laughs> just, for the, just for the heck of it, let's do a bit of Groucho Marx right here, because you do tell a cute story about meeting uh, Jeffrey, excuse me, George Osborne, the uh, British Chancellor of the Exchequer, the equivalent of the finance minister over here, who, upon meeting you, wanted to borrow a painting of yours. What's that story? Well, it, it, literally on the first day, uh, he, uh, I, there, there were, there's a portrait, as there often is in these institutions, of each of the governors or a portrait of a bust, uh, except for one uh, governor, a guy named Montague Norman, who was the governor in the 20s and 30s and 40s, and there were 13 of him, uh, and he wasn't, in the end, that successful uh, of a governor, so I took one down that was in my office. I thought, you know, 12 is probably enough. And uh, within, you know, five minutes, Osborne calls up, which told me something about the flow of information. And he asked to borrow it. And the reason he wanted it was to hang it in the dining room of number 11 Downing Street. Now, as you know, number 11 Downing Street is where the chancellor lives, right next to number 10, where the prime minister lives. And there's a great dining room there. Um, and that was the room in the 1920s, the mid-1920s, where... Montague Norman, this former governor, convinced Winston Churchill when he was the chancellor of the Exchequer to put the UK back onto the gold standard at the parity before the pre-war, so the pre-war level before World War I. Now, enormous amount had changed, and they put the UK back at this very overvalued exchange rate, in effect, and caused this massive uh, recession. Uh, as a consequence, Churchill lost his job and spent uh, you know, more than a decade in the wilderness. And Osborne has this portrait up because he wanted to remind himself never to listen to the advice of the governor of the Bank of England. So, uh, <laughs> and I, I have to say, um, you know, he didn't. <laughs> he didn't. And look, look where he is now. And, so and, and did Osborne listen to your advice after that? Uh, he listened. He did listen from time to time, but he didn't always listen to it. Not always. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's get back to a little more of Carl and a little less of Groucho. We do want to talk about some of the main themes that are facing us now in the 21st century, credit, COVID, and climate change. And I guess I want to start with this. In the, in the midst of a massive economic unheaval of the past year, the markets are doing just fine, thank you. How can that be? Yeah, uh, well, the markets are looking forward, as they always do, and they're judging that this is a, quote, temporary upheaval, and that actually the dislocation that comes from it and that's a fancy word for, you know, how many people are ultimately going to lose their jobs? How many companies will ultimately go bankrupt? Uh, the markets are judging that there, that will be limited and actually the economy will, will, grow more, uh, will, will grow again. Let's put it that way. We'll grow again. Very importantly, though, what the markets are also judging is that interest rates will be very low for a very long period of time. 
Um, now, those two don't necessarily go together. I mean, the more the economy grows, which is a good thing, we ultimately want the economy to grow. That's how uh, Canadians get ahead uh, as individuals. And I mean all Canadians, not just some Canadians. Um, if the economy is growing, over time, interest rates are going to rise and there will be some adjustment that comes from those markets. Um, but um, it's a product of um, it's a product of extraordinary circumstances. Um, what really matters um, is not the level of the markets, it's the jobs that are created and the sustainable jobs, jobs that will not just be around for a few months but uh, for decades and jobs that will lead to careers for our children. That's what matters coming out of this. And you know, you you, you asked about the uh, Montague Norman story, uh, which is, yeah, it's a, it's a cute story, but there's a point to that, which is what Norman forgot or what he didn't realize is the world had changed with the great upheaval of uh, the First World War. And the UK was not the same and new industries were rising and that they needed to make fundamental changes in order to take advantage of that. And his reaction was to go back to the glories of the past, which made things worse. Um, so our challenge is to, uh, is to assess what's changing, uh, how can we take advantage of that as Canada? And there's a huge range of opportunities there um, so that uh, it's not, the question of the markets being up, but it's uh, people's livelihoods being up and very importantly, the livelihoods of their children. As we consider how our political leaders have responded to the huge challenge that COVID-19 has presented, you do say, I think, some very interesting things about, about how we ought to judge political leadership, either in the province, the country, the world, whatever. And you say leaders need to be guided, guided by expertise rather than outsource decisions to expert. I hear Premier Doug Ford of, and listen, I'm not trying to get you in tr any trouble with anybody here. I'm really not. But, but, but you say this in the book, and this is the first thing that went through my head. Doug Ford, every day he comes to the microphone, says, I have to take the advice of the medical officer of health of the province of Ontario. I would never go against his advice. Now, by your definition, that's not wise leadership, right? Well, it's um, ultimately uh, leaders have to make decisions. And so um, uh, the premier in your example or the prime minister in the United Kingdom, uh, when they uh, are guided by advice, ultimately they are taking responsibility for implementing that advice. Um, that's the first point. The second is that we are in a situation where a number of jurisdictions thought, um, whether it, you know around the world thought that there was a trade-off between health and economics, you know, the economy versus health, and, and, and let's try to find the, the sweet spot. I think the point made in the book and the experience that we've lived through is in this case, there's not. Um, the, the, the primary objective, um, as has been the objective in Ontario and more broadly across Canada, has been people's health. Because ultimately, if we, uh, if we uh, you know, take, take off from lockdowns or, or other preventative measures too quickly, then we end up having a bigger surge and we have to lock down more. Plus, we've had, um, you know, the tragedies of the health outcomes. Now, that said, within the broader objectives of um, containing COVID, uh, there is questions about what's the most effective way to do it and what are the costs of those, including to broader health, uh, mental health, um, uh, you know, mental health, including domestic violence, uh, health of children who are not being adequately educated in many circumstances, and in some circumstances, uh, inequalities that exist in our society are exacerbated in these, you know, and is that truly being taken into account in all these, in all these judgments, uh, which have uh, you know, a primary weight on COVID um, and other aspects of health, which uh, may not be um, uh, weighted as much. I mean, and, and of course, the experts will make those. But I don't think as a leader, to get back to the core point, as a leader in these circumstances, as a leader in a financial crisis, as a leader in, in any circumstance, you take advice, but you make the decision, you own the decision. Um, and um, one of the things that is exceptionally difficult in this situation, although it's you know, we had similar things in, in the financial crisis, is uh, new information will come into play. We will learn. Sometimes we'll make mistakes. And it's very, very important to admit that um, and admit those mistakes or that those learnings and move on. And that's how you maintain trusted people. Last point, 
which is uh, it shouldn't be underestimated. You know, one of the things about leadership uh, is confidence um, and uh, quality of execution. Um, and, you know, that's, you know, a judgment that Canadians will make in terms of uh, uh, rollout of test and trace programs uh, or not. Uh, rollout of vaccination. Um, you know, vaccinate. There's no style points on vaccination. Vac- you know, people are vaccinated or they're not, um, and that's that's the judgment here in all levels of government. Uh, you know, working uh, as effectively as possible to uh, to get us in a position where we move out of um, of, of these extreme measures uh, and necessary measures. To be absolutely clear, I think necessary measures uh, that we're all living through. Necessary measures, to be sure, but at some point decisions are going to have to be made about what comes next. And I note that year over year, the government of Canada is probably spending, you know, getting close to 400 billion more this year than they did last year or pre-pandemic. Government of Ontario is approaching 30 billion more year over year spending. Uh, This obviously can't continue in perpetuity. So what, what kinds of decisions are we going to have to make going forward to figure all that out? Well, um, first, we're going to have to start to get out of this, um, which is determined by the health outcomes, as you well know. Um, but as we start to move out of this, then the, the challenge is going to be to, well, our objective should be moving from um, support um, to regeneration, regeneration of the economy, uh, making sure that, uh, look, I mean, the reality is here in Canada, Ontario and Canada, uh, for the first uh, probably two quarters after uh, the end of lockdown and true emergence from this, the economy is going to grow very rapidly. We're just, we'll just reopen a bunch of sectors of the economy. A number of people do have pent up savings uh, and have work and, and there will be a sharp uh, a pickup in growth. That's the easy bit. That is the easy bit. The question is, what's going to be sustained? And that will be driven by new businesses starting up. That will be driven by business investment. That will be driven by people's confidence. And that's determined by not, um, uh, you know, the relief rally, if you will, in the economy, uh, but confidence of where the, the direction for the economy. And so for governments as a whole, this shift, part of this spending, this the numbers you quoted, of course, is replacing bits of the economy that were shut down. And so some of it self-corrects because the economy opens up and that spending doesn't have to happen. We don't have to pay the CERB to somebody who is, whose job, thankfully, has restarted and they're going back to work as they want to. Um, but on top of that, we need to be very careful about not layering in a series of additional transfers or so-called current spending, when what we need is to support investment in the economy. And there's many ways to do that that don't involve spending money um, so that uh, we're building uh, we're building the industries and the jobs of, the, of, of, of today, um, but the careers of the future. And again, I'm, I'm going to over-labor the Montague Norman reference, but you know, some things have changed um, and some of the, uh, you know, the nature of our economy, changes in our economy have accelerated as a consequence of COVID. In general, that's a good thing for Canada, uh, but we have to be conscious of that and not go, you know, try and go back to status quo ante, back to the old ways, um, but uh, take advantage of some of these changes in a way that makes all Canadians' lives better. We've talked credit, we've talked COVID, let's talk climate change. And in particular, because of your role with the United Nations, I really want to get uh, <laughs> I really want to get your view on what transpired at the Conservative Party annual general meeting uh, over the weekend, where, despite the admonition of their leader, Aaron O'Toole, to get the party to think differently about climate change, fifty four percent of members went on the record to say they don't think climate change is real. How do you react to that? Uh, well, I, my, my first reaction is not to make a direct uh, political comment because I never fully understand the workings of political parties. Um, look, the issue is real. It's one of the core uh, challenges of our generation, of our age. Um, it is one of the biggest risks to the Canadian economy, and it's arguably the biggest opportunity uh, for the Canadian economy. I mean, after all, is Prime Minister Harper uh, used to say, uh, rightly so, that Canada is an energy superpower. Uh, the energies of the future um, are uh, can build on Canadian strengths, um, including in um, carbon capture, storage, uh, hydrogen, um, in uh, in hydro, uh, and direct air capture, and beyond. Uh, but we, you know, we need to consciously pursue those while we uh, while we manage our existing uh, resources. Um, this is a key 
element of competitiveness for uh, countries. Um, we've seen Europe's moving to zero emission vehicles, all vehicles zero emission by 2030. Uh, we are seeing a similar direction coming out of the United States. How well are we going to be integrated to that? We've made some initial steps in that direction. Very welcome with the, the Ford announcements and others. Uh, Ford, the company, not well, I'm sure Ford, the premier, will uh, be part of those announcements, <laughs> as well, I suppose, but so with the double Ford. Um, but we need an integrated strategy for this that is um, uh, that is truly building sustainable jobs. And I mean sustainable jobs as part of a sustainable economy, but sustainable jobs because they're jobs of the future uh, in the auto sector, in the energy sector, in the um, IT sector, because a lot of the solutions will come out of um, workings in uh, our machine learning and artificial intelligence sectors, which are, are burgeoning areas. Um, but you these things don't just happen. Uh, you need supportive policies with this. You need to understand that the issue is real um, and that we can play a leading role in addressing it. Um, and, uh, and, and yes, we have a res I think we have a responsibility to it, uh, including to younger Canadians in order to be at the forefront of this. But we also have a compelling economic reason to do it um, and to... Um, uh, to uh, you know, to 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 deny that or uh, is uh, I, I I I don't think serves uh, any of those objectives well. Well, Mr. Carney, we've reached the point in the interview that you know is coming and I know is coming, and you get asked every single time you do an interview. Yes. And so let's just do it and get it out of the way, shall we? Yeah. You know what I'm going to um, ask here. Uh, are you a member of a political party in Canada at the moment? I am not a member. You are not. Of Everybody yeah. thinks you're a liberal. Are you a big L liberal? Uh, well, I, I just def I just uh, disclose that I'm not a member of a political party. I am um, someone who's been uh, very fortunate to have a series of roles in public service. Um, I still I have one at the moment, uh, uh, working for COP26 in the UN, which has occupied a lot of my time. Uh, I'm someone who uh, likes to contribute to getting things done, um, and there's different ways to get things done. One of the ways to try to contribute to that is to uh, lay out and. Um, in, in detail, um, a number of uh, policy priorities that I think uh, Canada should follow, uh, which is uh, part of this book. It's not all of this book, but it's, a, it's, it's an important part of this book. You can't do what you have done in your life and you can't be who you have been in your life and then put 600 pages of policy on the record and started your own Twitter account, for goodness sakes. I mean, who the heck does that without people thinking, this guy's about to launch himself <laughs> into politics. So maybe we should the do... Maybe we should put the question this way. I think you're going to get in someday. Can you think of any reason why you wouldn't? Somebody else will do it better. That's a good reason. That is a very, you know, and, and that's, a, that's a, you know, that, that's not just a, a, an answer. Look, um, ultimately, um, politics, uh, government is there for a reason. Uh, in Canada, it's to, uh, you know, have a better future for Canadians, uh, help contribute to a better future uh, for Canadians. Uh, you need people of all walks of life uh, in politics. There's various ways to contribute to it. Um, and uh, it's, you know, look, I've seen it up close, uh, um, uh, you know, for uh, over a decade, uh, almost two decades, uh, and uh, uh, you know, I have enormous respect for those who put themselves out there and, and, and do it. And if if there's someone who can uh, accomplish these uh, these things, then uh, I'll fully support them. Okay, I'm going to let it go now. Okay, shall we move on? Yeah, I'm I'm fine with, <laughs> moving, I'm fine with moving on. It's so much fun playing that game with you, anyway. But yeah. okay, let's try this. Uh, you do point out in the book that. Job one of any government is to protect its citizens. And some governments have done a pretty good job of that, and some governments have done a very lousy job of that over the past year. So there is a crisis of public trust right now. What do you think it will take to rebuild that bridge of trust between governments and their citizens? Well, the first, uh, it takes time. Uh, anytime you have a failure, uh, it takes time to rebuild uh, trust, and there's many, you know, uh, colorful analogies for that. So I'll, I'll spare you, spare you them. Uh, but part of it will take a very deliberate approach to okay. So what what is it required for resilience? Um, and you know, I do use an analogy in the book, which is um, uh, there's a there, there's a house uh, just outside of Oxford, which has literally a giant white shark, great white shark uh, uh, sculpture uh, going through the roof. And the guy put it there be, uh, right after the Chernobyl uh, disaster. Uh, and his point was that these big risks from abroad come and hit you at home um, uh, out of the blue. Now, we've had 
a financial crisis that came from abroad. We've had a COVID crisis that coming from abroad. We have a climate crisis, which you know doesn't entirely come from abroad because we're we're, we're partly a contributor to it. Um, but we have these things. We will have uh, we have risks every day of a cyber crisis coming from abroad uh, as well. Now the responsibility of government is to think about those uh, it, those crises and take steps today to help protect the economy, protect Canadians because it's through no fault of Canadians that they're hit from these. And so they need to be protected. Um, and in order to protect, one of the first things, the point I make is you have to plan for failure. You have to plan that some big American bank is going to fail. You have to plan that a cyber attack is going to be successful. And then what are you going to do to make sure our systems continue to work? You have to plan that there's another virus that comes out of, you know, in, in, in some country so that we have the resources here, the capacity here to address, uh, to address, uh, the virus in the future, uh, and on and on and on. And, and, and that takes a very, you know, clear, you, somebody has to be responsible, organizations have to be responsible, the Bank of Canada on financial stability, you know, is it Public Health Canada uh, on uh, pandemic preparedness, and if they're not up to it, then who else should it be, but we should all know and hold them to account for it. You need to plan for failure, you need to build buffers, um, and, you, and you need uh, diversity, diversity in your system, uh, so that you're able to withstand that. And that's how you start to rebuild well, do your job. It's always, that's the way ultimately you build uh, build back trust is you fulfill your responsibilities. But that's some of the ways in which you actually actually do that. Hmm. The clock has just flown by, and we're literally down to our last minute here. But it dovetails nicely okay. out of what you just said, which is given the and I'll use a nice neutral word here. Given the uneven response of many governments around the world, do you feel any qualms about urging that? that the next rebound is going to be much more government-led than, than maybe some people who deal with the markets every day would appreciate. I, I okay, so that, thank you for saying that. I, that's not what I'm saying, actually. I think government has an important role in, in setting the direction for the economy. I don't think that this is, should be a return to the era of big government. Um, so let's, let's finish on climate, which is, it is as important that the government has set out uh, this path for the carbon price out uh, $170 by 2030 with the rebates for Canadians. That gives a very clear direction for business to invest in lower carbon uh, options. Uh, it is important that we know the regulatory framework for, sorry, the fancy words, but for the financial sector around net zero in this country because that will help allocate capital. It's important that the government puts money or regulation, including demand around hydrogen economy, around carbon capture and storage, because that reinforces Forces, uh, some of the big opportunities and needs, opportunities in Alberta, Saskatchewan, but also needs for addressing climate change. Most of those, what I just went through, those don't cost government money. And what they do is they set the direction for the economy. And then you have the best in the private sector, the young, the innovative, uh, the entrepreneurs, and they start to come up with solutions and solutions. You know, I've been around government a long time, solutions that government will not imagine. Um, and and to bring it back to the book, if I may, uh, because it's kind of a core point, is you have the values of society, sustainability and jobs and resilience, um, but delivered through the value of the market. And so set the direction for the economy, provide these guys post through regulation and, and, and carbon pricing and others, and then get the private sector as much as possible to uh, to drive the drive the solutions. Um, and that's that's how we'll move forward. The name of the book is Values, Building a Better World for All. If you don't go into politics, I'll tell you this, you'd make a hell of an economics professor because I actually understand <laughs> now, I actually understand what asset-backed commercial paper is now thanks to this book. Fantastic. Miracles abound. Thank you, Mark Carney. <laughs> Thank you very much, Steve. <laughs> They're calling it the most ambitious plan in the province's history to get Ontario to net zero emissions. The NDP recently unveiled its so-called Green New Democratic Deal. Yes, it's no doubt a takeoff on U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal of the Depression era and today's Green New Deal proposed by U.S. Democrats such as Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. The NDP feels this plan is a ticket to a cleaner Ontario and perhaps an election victory next year. 
Joining us to put this Green New Democratic deal under the microscope, we welcome, in Sarasota, Florida, Bruce Party, professor of law at Queen's University and senior fellow at the Fraser Institute. In Brooklyn, Ontario, which is just near Oshawa, Sarah Petrovan, director of policy at Clean Energy Canada. And in the west end of the provincial capital, Angela Bischoff, director of the Ontario Clean Air Alliance. And it's great to have you three on the program tonight. Just before we get your views on this, um, I'm not going to assume that everybody has heard about it. So let's go through a bit of a point form here with some of the highlights of this plan. And Sheldon, I'll ask you if you would to bring the graphics up and let's go through it point by point. The NDP would propose to implement Ontario's first ever comprehensive zero emissions vehicles strategy and support the move to eliminate internal combustion engine vehicles by the year 2035. They would offer incentives to Ontarians who purchase these zero emissions vehicles. They would give $600 for households to install EV charging stations at homes and require new homes to have vehicle charging capacity. They would retrofit existing buildings to be more energy efficient and ensure that all new buildings are as energy efficient as possible. The NDP says this would create 100,000 jobs over eight years as part of the retrofit program alone. They would electrify the GO train network along an accelerated timeline to replace dirty diesel trains along all lines. There would be no expansion of Ontario's nuclear capacity until cost and waste storage issues are resolved. The cost of all this, they estimated $40 billion, and they would pay for it this way. They would reintroduce to Ontario a cap-and-trade program, which would bring in $30 billion a year, and then sell green bonds for the rest to the tune of $10 billion. That's the Green New Democratic deal, as outlined recently by Ontario's official opposition. Now, this is a, a very comprehensive plan. We've only put some of the highlights there. There's a lot more to it than that. Generally speaking, just before we go deep on this, um, Sarah, start us off here. General thoughts on what the NDP is trying to propose. It's a good climate plan. I mean, you know, we've been doing climate planning in globally now for a number of years. And, you know, the conversation has advanced significantly since we started talking about this, Steve, five years ago. It checks all the boxes. It deals with Ontario's major sources of emissions, which are buildings, transportation, heavy industry. It does, frankly, the level of effort that needs to get done. Bruce, your view. Uh, nonsense on stilts, as Jeremy, Jeremy Bentham once said. This is uh, describing the NDP's version of a socialist utopia that would actually be a nightmare. In a way, it's I think the NDP's um, attempt to transition us from a COVID emergency to a permanent climate emergency. Uh, it reads like it's been put together on the back of an envelope. It's not well costed. You know it's going to cost more than $40 billion. It's, um, it's a little crazy. Uh, I'm going to infer from that that you disagree with uh, Sarah. Just, just, just a tad. Just a tad. Gotcha. Okay. Angela, would you weigh in on this, please? I think it's a very strong climate plan. It calls for the phase out of Ontario's gas-fired power plants. Uh, in stark contrast to Doug Ford's plan of ramping up gas 500%, it calls for more wind and solar power. It calls for more water power imports from Quebec and more conservation. And uh, it's just taking us in a different direction than the existing uh, Ford government plan, which is more nuclear and gas and less renewables and conservation. Let's ask the key question, though, Angela, which is, will it achieve what it sets out to achieve. What it wants to do is get Ontario to net zero emissions in 30 years. With this plan, is that doable? Well, we could get to net zero emissions in the electricity sector by 2030 just by phasing out our gas-fired power plants. That could meet all of our climate objectives in this province. And we could easily replace them with low-cost wind, water, solar, and conservation. So yes, we can do this. Bruce, I know you're not a fan, but if this were to happen, will it actually get us to net zero by 2050? Okay, first question is what they mean by net zero. I mean, net means removing as much carbon as you put into that to the atmosphere. Right. And it is probable that Canada, and for that matter, Ontario, is already net zero in the sense that we have a lot of land cover with a lot of forests, and those forests probably absorb 
more carbon than the whole country puts out already. So we already have a problem in terms of defining exactly what the goal is. They have all kinds of ambitious uh, plans to reduce carbon emissions. So maybe that's not what they mean by net zero, but the term's not well defined. So who knows? Sarah, you had a very quizzical look on your face there as Bruce was uh, outlining what he thought net zero meant. Uh, I, I won't draw any inferences. What did you mean by it? I mean, you know, is it possible for the NDP plan to get to net zero emissions? Yes. Are we at net zero emissions now? Absolutely not. If we were at net zero emissions now, there would be no need for international action. There would be no need for action in Ontario. And really, you know, what the NDP is proposing is putting Ontario on a level playing field with where the rest of the world is going, where Ontario's largest trading partners are going, where Canada's largest trading partners are going. Like, let's be clear, this is no longer an environmental imperative. It's an economic one. All right. Let's follow up with this then, Sarah. The, the I guess the the foundation for this plan, the thing that's going to pay for it, is reintroducing cap and trade. We had cap and trade in Ontario under the previous Kathleen Wynne government. When the Liberals fell, Doug Ford came in, cancelled it. Now the NDP say they want to put it back in. Is it a good idea to try to do that? Sure. You need, you need carbon pricing to send an economic signal. Even the Fraser Institute agrees that it is the most efficient way of reducing emissions. And so, you know, it's important to have carbon pricing as the backbone of any uh, climate plan. Bruce, is that right? You'd be okay with a return to the cap and trade plan? No, no, I wouldn't. Now, I'm not endorsing a carbon tax. I think that's crazy. But if you're going to go down that road, a carbon tax is probably the best way to do it because it's transparent. A cap and trade system is inherently political. Uh, you're going to scare off all your industry and your investment. Uh, I think it's very unlikely that you will get the kind of tax revenue that they're expecting. And of course, the costs will be more than they are planning. So all in all, even on their own terms, I think it's a bad plan. Angela, the idea of returning to a cap and trade plan, the likes of which we had in the province uh, two and a half years ago or more. Uh, what's your view on that? We support a rising price on carbon because it's an effective and powerful tool to reducing greenhouse gas pollution. Where there are pros and cons to the cap and trade versus versus other options, uh, carbon tax, whether the revenues are returned to individuals or to government to fund greenhouse gas pollution reduction programs, uh, both will uh, reduce climate pollution and both will create a rise on pricing. And we, we, could, uh, we would support either because we support carbon pricing. Angela, let me follow up with this. I wonder whether the markets would say, province of Ontario, you had a cap and trade system under the Liberals, then the Conservatives came in and cancelled it. If the NDP get in, they're going to bring it back. Who knows, maybe the next government would cancel it. Why don't you guys get your act together? Why would the, uh, why would the private sector not just say, we're not going to do business with Ontario because this is just too nutty? Because the private sector is also asking for carbon pricing. They recognize this is the way the future is going around the world. Uh, uh, countries around the world are phasing out fossil fuels and moving to a renewable future. And uh, uh, industry recognizes this. So they're asking for carbon pricing. Bruce, what's your view on that? It's true that uh, some industry are sort of climbing on a bandwagon, but in general, when companies make their own self-interested decisions, which they should do, they try to avoid extra costs that provide no extra revenue. And cap and trade is one of those things. Uh, if, if Ontario produces an environment in which the energy policy is unstable, which it has been over a period of time, then I suspect that that will not produce the kind of environment that will encourage companies to both invest and stick around. Sarah, I gather we've been having some difficulty with your line to Brooklyn, but we've got you back now. So can I get you to weigh in on the main point here, which was uh, when cap and trade was in place in Ontario under the Liberals before 2018, it did certainly bring billions of dollars into the Treasury to be spent on green programs. The question is whether it made the air any cleaner in Ontario. What can you tell us on that? So the thing about cap and trade is it re its environmental integrity relies on where you set the cap. So you are not allowed to 
emit beyond what the cap is set at. And so in many ways, it provides much more certainty in terms of GHG reductions than other forms of carbon pricing systems, although each system all has its pros and its cons. So if you can set the cap at a reasonable amount in line with the emissions that you need to reduce and model out how that works with the complementary policies you put in place, you know, things like to reduce uh, emissions in the transportation and the building sector, which this plan also talks about, you can get reasonable, real GHG reductions from a cap and trade system. Okay. I want to move on and talk about what, um, what may be one of the most interesting parts of this new deal uh, by the NDP, and that is the New Democrats' position on nuclear. We know in the past that the NDP has always been very anti-nuclear energy. Having said that, they are not pledging to get us out of the nuclear power generation business in Ontario. What they've said is status quo until we can make sure that we've got some way to deal with the spent fuel rods and nuclear waste, et cetera, et cetera. I find that a pretty interesting position. Angela, what's your take on that? Well, I think they're they're positioning positioning themselves to uh, be opposed to new nuclear power in the province. Be and uh, so that means no to new SMRs and small and modular reactors. On, thank you, and that's based on their commitment to affordable power and equity. Um, but I don't think they go quite far enough. The Green Party of Ontario, for example, also calls out for a moratorium on the rebuilding of the existing nuclear power reactors, which is a $26 billion program that the Ford government is, is embarking on by rebuilding Darlington and Bruce. So I think that uh, the NDP is going in the, the right direction by questioning the costs of nuclear power and, uh, and the c concerns about waste. Bruce, what's your view on the New Democrats' apparent new position not to get us out of the nuclear power business? I suspect that they find themselves painted into a corner. Uh, our hydro resources are basically tapped out. There's probably no new places to, to, to do hydro. If they are dead set against building new uh, fossil fuel uh, power plants, uh, keep in mind that the renewables, that is wind and solar, don't actually help you build base load. So they're not really a solution. For every solar farm or wind farm that you build, you need other dependable sources to kick in when the wind stops blowing or the sun stops shining. And nuclear can do that and, and, um, and uh, gas powered can do that. But if you're choosing between those two things, it might be that the NDP is realizing that in order to maintain this, this carbon emission platform, they're going to have to settle for nuclear. Yeah, Sarah, that's the key question. Do you think the NDP have come to the realization that you just simply can't keep the lights on in the province of Ontario, which depends on nuclear power for more than half its electricity generation, if you don't have nuclear as part of the mix? You need to have a non-emitting source of base load power. Nuclear power has a lot of challenges with it. Cost is one of them. Waste is one of it. You know, we don't have an answer to deal with nuclear waste in this province. We can't find a willing host community. But, you know, there are other options. It would involve uh, inner ties and building transmission with uh, provinces neighboring us that do have an abundance of hydro resources, namely Quebec and Manitoba. So it's feasible to assume that at some point down the road, you may be able to replace nuclear power, but it's not a reality right now. So I think what the NDP is recognizing is that, okay, at least as it is now, it is a non-emitting source. That is, nukes, when they're up and running, do not emit GHGs. But I think they've also left the door open to the future to other technologies and other clean energy solutions including, you know, importing clean electricity from other neighboring provinces and also looking at things such as energy storage, which does deal with the intermittency of renewables. I want to be super clear on this, though, Sarah. Are you saying that if we build transmission lines to the hydroelectric plants in Quebec or in Manitoba, that that could provide the province of Ontario with enough baseload electricity to get by on renewables and no nukes? I don't know, to be honest with you, Steve, I don't want to say 100% yes, because I don't know how much power we could feasibly import and how much everybody has to export. 
but it it should it could certainly replace a big chunk of our baseload power. Angela, where are you on that? The IESO has done numerous studies claiming that That's we could import. Angela, we're we're in an, an acronym-free zone here, so you're talking about the independent Thank electricity you. system operator. Thank you. <laughs> uh, that th that we I, we have the grid between Quebec and Ontario already, and we could triple imports already with existing transmission infrastructure, importing enough water power from Quebec, and they have the surplus to replace even all of our gas at present. But we could also import much more by upgrading the transmission lines between the two provinces. And the IESO is, has identified three or four very low cost uh, options for increasing uh, the imports of water power from Quebec dramatically. And yes, with a combination of water power from Quebec, wind and solar in Ontario, and conservation, we could replace our nuclear and our gas-fired power plants. And I'd just like to add as well that um, Quebec's hydro reservoirs can act as a giant battery. So by integrating Ontario's wind and solar power with Quebec's hydro reservoirs, we can convert our intermittent wind and solar into a 24-7 source of, of electricity supply. At what cost? At very low cost. Quebec has been offering us for years water power from Quebec at just five cents a kilowatt hour. That is a third of the price of building new nuclear reactors in Ontario or of even half the price of, of rebuilding our, age, our uh, aging reactors. So it's very low cost. It's renewable power. And we've got the grid between the provinces. And there's no opposition to the existing water power uh, uh, supply in, in Quebec. So it, it's it's... It's a no-brainer. Well, it's low cost for the electricity itself, but you've got to build the transmission network to get it here. That would presumably cost several billions upon billions of dollars, would it not? No, the ISO has identified three transmission grid upgrades. One is $80 million, one is $280 million, and one is just over a billion dollars. That's to import 6,000 megawatts, which is more than the Darlington reactor for uh, station, for example, which OPG says will cost $13 billion. So it's very low cost in comparison to nuclear power. Bruce, what's your view on this? Well, I think we need to get some perspective here. We're talking about longer term plans. I mean, right now, Ontario has more power than it needs. And the NDP is not learning from the lessons that the Liberals taught us when they put all the plans for all these renewable projects in place. Those renewable projects, the 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 the, the tariffs and so on, the feed-in tariffs pro programs, have caused power bills for Ontario residents to skyrocket. And while in this plan, the NDP is pretending to want to look out for the little guy, it was those energy policies that created one of the main problems right now for affordability in Ontario. And yet they're going down the same road in terms of dictating what technology should be used and when it should be done and exercising managerial control over the sector. And that that is ignoring the lesson. Right now, we have more power than we need. We have to offload it onto, onto other jurisdictions and, and people are paying enormous amounts for their power. And e e even though power now is, as was pointed out, is not that expensive to produce. Okay, I know we could talk more about this, but I do want to cover off some of the other aspects of the plan as well. Talking about energy efficient buildings. And again, I don't know how many of these numbers we have to take with a grain of salt, so I'm, I'm going to ask all of you because you're the experts. But the NDP does say in its Green New Democratic deal that by investing in retrofits between the years 2022 and 2030, Ontario could see more than $15.2 billion added to our annual GDP the value of the goods and services produced in our economy, which should create about 100,000 good jobs. 15.2 billion leading to 100,000 new good jobs. Question, Sarah, do those numbers sound reasonable? I mean, they could they could be reasonable. Energy efficiency uh, is a huge job creator. It also, uh, you know, you can reduce GHG emissions with it. And more importantly, you can help businesses and residents save money on their on their energy bills. Um, so, you know, it is entirely feasible that you could see that level of economic benefit. I mean, it's important to reduce 
GHGs in our buildings. It's, you know, Ontario's uh, third largest source of emissions. And so it's wise that they named uh, and retrofit an energy efficiency program in their climate plan. Angela, I think every party at some point rolls out the let's retrofit our buildings and make them more energy efficient, use better insulation and yada, yada, yada. The question is, is there really that much to be had by doing all of those things? There's no question. We've only uh, touched the surface of our energy efficiency potential, and it's our lowest cost option to reducing electrical demand. It saves homeowners money, and it reduces greenhouse gas pollution, and it reduces the outflow of Ontario dollars to Western Canada or to Pennsylvania to buy fracked gas. So there's, there's so much more that can be done, especially once we reach economies of scale, it just becomes so much lower cost. Bruce? Uh, another instance of fairy tale economics. You know, you, you bring in more tax revenue, you increase your spending, you create these jobs, and you produce an economic utopia. That's not the way it works. You're, you, the, the, the more control and the more influence and the more direction <laughs> government has over the economy, the less your, con your economy is going to strive. So this idea that you're going to produce these many jobs uh, effortlessly by increasing taxes, by putting in the cap and trade program again, that uh, just, it just doesn't measure up. And again, here we're talking about reducing electricity use, which, as we pointed out, is mostly produced in Ontario today from non-carbon emission sources. So all of the effort, all the taxes, all the spending is being directed at, at something that's not even consistent with the plan's own premise. Well, let me introduce now uh, an idea as part of this green plan that would increase, presumably dramatically, electricity use. And that is the notion that within 15 years' time, there will be no more internal combustion engines being sold in the province of Ontario. Um, I want to read something here from the Financial Post that Bjorn Lomborg, uh, the sort of skeptical environmentalist, wrote in 2020 about electric cars taking over the market. Here's what he said. Though technological innovation will eventually make electric cars economical even without subsidies, concerns over range and slow recharging will remain. That is why most scientific prognoses show that electric cars will increase in sales but not take over the world. A new study shows that by the year 2030, just 13% of new cars will be battery electric. Governments that ban new fossil fuel cars would essentially be forbidding 87% of consumers from buying the cars they want. It's hard to imagine that could be politically viable. Okay, we have two very, Sarah, very dramatic uh, differences of opinion here. On the one hand, Lomborg saying, you just can't get there from here, and the NDP saying, oh no, we're getting there from here. How's this gonna work? Well, the thing is, is that it's really just not the NDP that's saying this. What the NDP is doing is they're really just reflecting where the rest of the world is going. You have major automakers, right? We build GM cars here in Canada. GM is saying that by 2035, they are no longer selling internal combustion engines. You see similar, uh, you know, commitments from Land Rover, Jaguar, Cadillac, Volkswagen, you know, Ford Motor Company is saying that by 100% of their cars in Europe are going to be electric by 2030. So really, you know, they're just reflecting a commitment of where auto manufacturers are going, where other countries are going, and where the rest of the world is going. And that's why is given that, you know, auto manufacturing is a huge uh, economic driver for Ontario. It's our major, it's our major export. And so in some ways, you know, if Ontario doesn't put policy in place to put us in uh, in line with where the rest of the world is going, we're going to miss out. And I think that's what the NDP is starting to recognize in this report. Angela, if that's true, again, we're talking future, so who knows, but if that's true, and that's the way it rolls out, and suddenly we have a society whereby millions upon millions of people are plugging in their electric vehicles into their new home recharging stations every single night, do we have the electricity generation possibility to handle that kind of new load. 
Well, as Bruce mentioned, we do at uh, the current uh, time have surplus power. And we're saying we should be closing some of the nuclear stations because we have so much surplus power. But uh, again, a, a study done for the independent electricity system operator, the IESO, said that one million electric vehicles on the Ontario added to Ontario would only increase uh, demand by 2%. So, and having all the passenger vehicles in the province would increase demand by 17%. And we think we could meet that increased demand through conservation efforts, uh, wind and water, solar power, et cetera. You know, um, the previous government in the last decade reduced demand in the province by 10%. And that was really just through uh, investing in the low hanging conservation fruit. There's so much more potential to reduce demand dramatically that yes, we can handle the increase in, uh, uh, in electricity required by electric vehicles. But also keep in mind that uh, electric vehicles are uh, are parked 90% of the day and they can uh, put their power back into the grid during the high peaks and take the power out at nighttime when we have low peaks. So they can act as a storage option as well. Bruce, I'm down to my last 40 seconds. Let me give it to you in answering the question on whether you think it's advisable for all new homes, all new apartments, all new condos, to have to, by law, put in EV charging stations? No, because you're making consumers' choices for them in the same way you're talking as they are with the electric vehicles. The electric vehicles and the charging stations are only viable if the government subsidizes them. That tells you that consumers are not buying them on their own. The reasons that car manufacturers and so on are in favor of all this is because of the money. They're making money on electric vehicles because governments are, are footing the bill. If you get government out of it, you'll find out what people actually want. And what they want is not electric vehicles that have a limited range and a long recharging time. The technology is not ready for, for the big time. The percentage of electric cars is still very, very small, as Bjorn points out. This is government choosing technology, which is not the way it's supposed to work. It never does. As we often say on this program, to be continued. Uh, we thank Bruce Party and Sarah Petrovan and Angela Bischoff for their... I guess, first rendering on the Green New Democratic Deal. More to come in the months and days ahead, no doubt. Thanks, you three. Thanks, dude. And that is the agenda for Tuesday, March 23rd, 2021. Amidst a pandemic and the ensuing economic crisis, tomorrow is Budget Day in Ontario. We'll speak to the Minister of Finance, his critics in the other parties, and some of the business folks who are watching closely for solutions they hope are aimed at them. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.